John McWard, how are you? Hey, Glenn. How are you? Doing fine. I am Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show, blogheads.tv. I'm with John McWhorter. I'm a professor at Brown University. John's a professor at Columbia University. The Watson Institute for International Public Affairs sponsors the Glenn Show at Brown University. Uh, John and I are the black guys at blogheads.tv. And uh, we're back, man. And, uh, you know, the news of the day uh, is that last night uh, it was announced that the uh, New York Times 1619 Project and uh, one Hannah Jones are recipients of a Pulitzer Prize, or I should say Pulitzer Prize. I keep saying Pulitzer and I keep getting corrected. Of a Pulitzer Prize for their 1619 project, of which you and I have been critical here at the Glenn Show at blogheads.tv, us being the black guys and the so-called not woke black guys, the mm-hmm. contrarian black guys. You can speak for yourself. Of course, I'm just introducing this conversation. <laughs> Me being notorious in my own wicked way, uh, have, you know, declared for the world that we ain't woke and there's a problem here. Uh, we even write essays about it. But the world doesn't agree with us, John. And I'm inviting your commentary. Uh, the world, you remember ta Coates? Anybody ever heard of him? Uh, he won some prizes, too. We objected here, too, and nobody gives a damn, okay? Nobody is listening, all right? Uh, we would appear to be the odd man out, odd men out, and uh, the fact that someone might speculate about our motives and our feelings of security and standing and whatnot is not unreasonable, given that we're in this position of complete repudiation and defeat by the cultural barons of this great society. So I invite your commentary, John, because I don't know, how do I keep going on, given that, you know, the wind seems to be blowing unrelentingly in my face? Um, Well, you know, with that Pulitzer, I never doubted that it was going to happen. I mean, I just assumed, yes, it just like, you know, when it rains. Oh, just like that National Book Award? Um, frankly, yeah. When it rains, the ground gets wet. Just, you know, like, those, like, just like those MacArthur Genius uh, Prizes that neither you nor I have won, it'll be quick to be pointed out in the comments yeah. section, and that we can't yeah. barely bear it. We can't stand the fact that we haven't been honored in that same way. No, that's the, it's the thing. I mean, it's, to think that the 1619 Project wasn't going to get one of those prizes would be like, there's a bad analogy to use these days, but it's all I can think of. It's like getting a cold and hoping that you're never going to have to blow your nose. I just knew. <laughs> but I'm not as annoyed as you are because I really... I didn't say I was annoyed. I said I was defeated. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a rarefied crowd who are giving out those kinds of awards. And I really have made my peace with the fact that it's not about the facts. I mean, you look at you know, historians like Sean Willens are showing, you know, smack down that the facts don't work and that we're not talking about the entire 1619 package. We're talking about the Nicole Hannah Jones part, that it just doesn't work. All of this is very visible. And yet I thought none of that is going to have any effect because this is not about the truth. This is about a certain kind of white person showing that they're not racist. And for those people, Showing that you're not a racist trumps the truth. And we've seen that over and over. And so I knew this was going to happen. And I was kind of thinking, I hope nobody like me thinks there's any chance that it isn't going to happen. But you know what bothers me? This is what bothers me about it. Fine. You know, these prizes. And we've talked about how I don't write thinking about those prizes. I know that, you know, my positions on race are such that with the people who give those awards, I would never make it past them. And my work on language isn't significant enough. I'm not going to get that. This is what bothers me about that, though. It's exactly what you're saying. Now that, and I hate getting ad feminine about her, especially because from what I've seen, she doesn't take kindly to it. And next thing you know, did you say ad feminine, man? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I thought you said. Go on. Nicole Nicole Hannah-Jones now has that imprimatur. And what it means is that the conversation we're having right now, and I don't care about the comments section, but just anybody, <laughs> we're jealous. 
you know, couldn't be that we have legitimate concerns about lies being put forward as black history, about somebody whose take on black history is faulty and even immature, and yet smart white people are letting it pass out of a sense that that's giving us a compliment. We're not supposed to complain about that. We're just jealous that we didn't get the Pulitzer. And if we say we're not jealous, it only makes us look more jealous. I don't like that. So that's the only reason that I wish it hadn't gotten that, because it means we can't criticize it without looking like jerks. Well, that's certainly true. We're a bunch of Ivy League professors. You know, we're lost, lost in some ivory tower situation. We are, you know, I got a memoir that I haven't finished. They can always hang that one around my neck. I, you know, I got writer's block. And I'm not saying I got writer's block. That's what will be said about me. I'm taking my own damn time, okay? Y'all will <laughs> like it when you see it. But, <laughs> but, you know, and there are all kinds of angles of attack uh, in our comfortable, cushy, upper middle class, bourgeois, African-American contrary and bubble existence that people can uh, tell. I mean, this is a woman, I'm talking about Nicole Hannah-Jones, who likes herself to Ida B. Wells. Uh, she tweeted, I got the prize on the same day that Ida B. Wells got the prize in whatever year that was, a century ago. And, uh, you know, that's so comical as to not even be worthy of commenting on. I mean, your your line uh, that I've seen in one of, one of the things that you wrote that says it's a performance mistaking itself for activism is uh, is is exactly exemplified by that by that juxtaposition. But 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 it sounds like you're taking your stand with the truth, capital T. Mm-hmm. Uh, I agree. I mean, I yeah. agree that I agree that the interpretation of the American Revolution as having been primarily fought in order to preserve American slavery from the depredations of the British who might otherwise have abolished it is false. So say the Gordon Woods of the world and so forth and so on. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. But I don't agree that history is a place. You know, this is, we are an army in retreat, okay? The enemy have breached our lines. We are rolling back, okay? And that bunker with T-R-U-T-H on it, it's not gonna hold it. It's not gonna hold it at all. No. At least if it's a technical assertion, you didn't quite get that piece of history right. Abraham Lincoln's interest in exporting African uh, uh, liberated persons to Africa was not the sum and substance of his outlook on the world. You misunderstand the nature of the American founding. You don't see slavery in its global context. You don't understand American capitalism and all that. I mean, you're right about all of that. It's toy history. It's Faux history, it's, it's history is fashion fad and so mm -hmm. forth. There's something insubstantial about it, something that lacks in a kind of sophisticated complexity and a kind of, you know, okay, so we're not historians, but I think I will stand with that. But it's not only that. Yeah. It's not only that. Uh, it's got the wrong values, John. Okay, it's yes. not just truth. It's also, uh, you know, intent, purpose, mm. vision, ideology, theory. What's their theory of the case? America ain't shit. That's one of the first lines in the theory. America mm -hmm. ain't all that it's been hyped up to be. That's what they want and to teach to our children. They break in it's briefly. not about the truth. I just want to make this yeah. point clear. You, of course you can break in. I just want to be clear. Yeah. The issue here is not the truth. The issue is what is America to me? Right. Okay, that's the and question. And there quickly, are other questions like that. Go ahead. Very quickly, it's America ain't shit. And the only people who've brought it close to being something other than that are black people. There's that other part. The idea that we fought for our own emancipation, white people were barely involved. That brought us closer to the, you know, the, the American ideal, which is a vastly oversimplified portrait right there. Anyway, go ahead. No, I, I don't want to uh, monopolize. I think you have a lot of important things to say, but I was going to make this point that um, I don't think the truth is going to do it for us. I, it's necessary, but not sufficient. And I think there's a values conflict that's at play. And I want to try to enumerate what I thought those values are. And the primary value is about American nationalism, about the meaning of the American experiment, about what kind of country this is, about whether or not we want to uh, plant our flag there, so to speak, identify with it, um, take pride in it, uh, be in possession of all that is the fruit of this civilization, okay? Whether as African-Americans, as we identify ourselves and understand ourselves, we are Americans at that deep root. Uh, not to make a rhetorical point out of the Americanness of our grandfather who might have fought in a war somewhere, which is done in the literature of uh, the 1619 Project, 
on the way to uh, trashing the founding, uh, but a more robust and a less identitarian understanding of our place mm-hmm. within American civilization. That's what's at stake. Another yeah. thing is another thing that's at stake is failure. I know you don't like the word. This is not just didn't quite dot the I and cross the T, okay? African-American society is in trouble in the 21st century. The so-called disparities are a reflection of our failure. I know that's very hard for people to take, and I'll get pushed back. And go ahead and push back. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. Failure. No wonder you have to overstate the contribution of the slaves to the creation of the American political economy. Of course, it was non-trivial, but it was by by no means the only thing going on, as you point out in that fine essay of yours that I have read. By no means was it the only thing going on. So, So what is that about, really? It's a desperate struggle for dignity in the face of failure. Okay, what's all this stuff about the cops in the prisons about? Come on, transparently, it's about failure. What's all this stuff about the black family about? In a very uncomplicated way, we are collectively not being very good about how we're raising our children. What's the educational gap about? What's the wealth gap about? It's about businesses that didn't get started. You think the Jews had a path paved with gold when they came to this country from Eastern Europe for crying out loud? You think the Irish didn't work in sweatshops for a century building this country? How dare you not include them in your account of the foundations of American prosperity? The arrogance of it, the solipsism of it is stunning and it is compensatory and it's about failure. And that has to be said. You're not going to stop them with, quote, unquote, the truth. you got to meet their ideology head on. I invite yeah, your response. There is a whole room of people right now with dreadlocks and smelling of coconut who are listening to Nicole Hannah-Jones saying, but they were white. And everybody starts going like this and saying amen. And that's their truth. And so she doesn't see it the way you see it. You know, She says, well, the Irish and the Italians, they were white. It's different. If you're black, get back. And if you don't know that... And yeah, you're not woke. And, you know, they think they think they've got the lock on it. But, you know, it, truth, you talk about truth. It's not only about obscuriana about the Revolutionary War and whatever people wrote down. It's also that a whole lot of that whole project is based on it's a person like her. And it's not just her. I mean, it's all the people we talk about. Those people are deeply concerned that white people understand that it isn't our fault. Like all that you just said about failure to them is like a punch in the stomach. They want white people to know that if there are any disparities between black people and white people, it's because of what happened in the past. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. Then next is you guys are on the hook. You guys are on the hook. But especially it's not our fault. And where I come down on that is let's say that you can do some logical puzzle and you really can take any problem that black people are having today and you can connect the dots and take it back to a bunch of people coming up on the shore in Virginia in 1619. Okay, you could do that. It would be an interesting, it's like Robert Bork. It'd be an intellectual feast to do that with just any problem that we have. Let's say that that's true. Why are they so obsessed with it? Why do they care so much about whether white people understand that it's our fault, almost savoring that there would be no way of measuring whether just enough white people know just enough that it's our fault? It's because they're getting off on that because it's a way of assuaging insecurity. It's because they have been minted in a sense that to be black, the essence of it is to feel like you're owed something, is to feel oppressed. And you therefore, the idea that white people don't understand Nominally, it's something they're upset about, but really, it's a kind of pride. I am a member of the group who was never understood, and all of these people who call themselves so enlightened have to understand that, oh, it's not our fault, it's not our fault. I find that untruthful because it means that those people don't like themselves. Any self-regarding human being doesn't care remotely that much about what the ruling class thinks of them, and as our friend Coleman has put forth, you don't have to have this perfect love from the ruling class to get ahead. That's an analysis that a certain overeducated group of the descendants of African slaves during the last three decades of the 20th century came up with. And we are still saddled with it now. None of those people know that what they're putting forth 
is evidence of self-hate. And they're going to call us the Uncle Toms, et cetera. They don't like themselves because if they did, they wouldn't be so obsessed with what white people think. But, and I'm almost done. I think that um, you and I have to be careful. Once, this was tacky, but I understood where he was coming from. Part of the reason that ta Coates is not my favorite person, it has nothing to do with his fame in the teens. And yes, I did say he's not my favorite person. We do not like each other. And it goes back to stuff that happened in the aughts, one of which was that before my book on hip hop, All About the Beat, came out, before anybody had read it, he wrote a blog piece where he said that my writing that book made me a bully. And his idea was that I'm just, you know, I'm this PhD intellectual and I'm beating up on all these men from the streets expressing themselves, calling me a bully. Now, anybody who reads that book knows that I am much too sympathetic to the music to be called a bully. But that sort of thing does make you think, what is a bully and how much ammunition do you want to fire at people? And to tell you the truth, Nicole Hannah-Jones isn't a historian and that doesn't mean she isn't very intelligent, but she's a journalist. She read some books. She has an agenda. She probably read a lot of books. And she came up with something. It was wrong. She was told she was wrong. She can't, she won't admit that she was wrong because her whole sense of why she's alive on this earth is tied up at the kind of points she was making. But how, maybe I'm reading into what you're saying, but how angry can we be at or about her? Personally, I don't like her attitude on social you mean media. without I'm becoming seeing... bullies. I just want to make sure I'm following you. How right. angry can we be without being a bully? I'm trying to make sure I yeah, understand your, in the, your the anger is that a bunch of overeducated white people patted her on the head. Really, the anger for me is at them. She couldn't help what she did. It's the people who are so paternalistically refraining from letting the error in her work have its true implications that make me angry. And it's not because those people haven't given me a prize. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that if they feel that way about her, so somebody might say, why does it bother you? If they're patting that black person on the head, it means that the same people are probably doing the same thing to me. They don't give me Pulitzer prizes, but it means that that's their view of black people in general. And I don't like it. I don't blame you. I, I've got two words written down here on my pad. One of them is self-hatred, uh, apropos of your, uh, of your analysis. And the other one is patronization, apropos of the point that you're making right now. And I think those two things go, go very closely together. If you were self-hating, you wouldn't be so obsessed with how it is that you appear in the mind of the putative oppressor. You're living in his head. Um, why do you care what he thinks? He's the oppressor, after all. Okay. Why do you make him the agent of your deliverance? Why are all of your appeals directed to him? We have to have a conversation about race. Come on. That is the position of weakness, supplication. Okay. Exactly. So, so you hate yourself, perhaps because you can't look failure in the mirror. Uh, but uh, I blended my little idea with yours. But I mean, you know, <laughs> patronization. And yeah, of course, that's the flip side of it. That is the woke uh, ally, white ally. Uh, whether it be at the cultural establishments that decide things like Pulitzer Prizes or whatever, uh, who sees this as a vehicle for expressing their own progressive commitment to whatever, whatever. Also looking failure in the face, they can't help but miss it. I mean, they can't, you know, not miss it. What, what do I mean to say? How can they miss it? Yeah, that's what I mean to say. They can't, I they, cannot, they cannot miss it. Yeah. Uh, and they have to rationalize it somehow. And you say it's not not our own fault. Of course, it is our fault. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look at here's the existential truth. You're responsible for what happens in your life. Flat out, full stop. I didn't say that we're not exigencies. Exigencies are a part of the human condition. I didn't say yours were worse or better than other people's. Perhaps they were worse. I don't know. They couldn't all be the same. Otherwise, it would be flat. We know there's texture in life. Some people suffer. Mm-hmm. Now, what have you done with your life? How have you raised your children? What do you have to show? We're responsible for that, period. This is why I say you must identify the ideological fault lines and you must be clear about what you're saying. Um, Shelby Steele nailed this. Uh, 35 years ago, John, about this moral exchange between a weak, self-doubting 
victim of slavery and discrimination on the one hand, and a morally compromised uh, over uh, 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 you know, upper uh, social class and cultural uh, power who want not to be charged as deficient in terms of racism. And the exchange between them is corrupt at its core, John. It's corrupt and it's destructive of African-American human dignity. These people are looking for dignity. They're not going to find it in their corner of uh, waving this bloody shirt. They're not going to find it. They only exhibit their own weakness. We have actually got to do something here, Black people. We're not going to get out of this hole until we actually dig our way out of it. Full stop. Nobody's coming to save us. We have to build businesses. That's how the wealth gap is going to be closed. Reparations is an absolute disaster for Black people. It is a disaster morally, as well as a political dead end. But it is a moral disaster. It's an intellectual crime. I'm sorry. Yes, it's a crime against my people. It strips them of our dignity. Let us succeed or fail on our own account. That's the way of the world, period. These people want to be serfs. And and you're right. There can be nothing but self-contempt at the root of that. Yeah. See, Glenn, you're making me think about who's winning. Because my habit of mind is to think of... The people we're surrounded by and often like, which is this overeducated class of white people that we drink white wine with when we do things. All those people, you know, individually, they're fine. You know, it's those people are not the world. You know, this new mantra that Twitter is not the world. Those people are not the world. But of course, those people are in positions of power. It's funny. Last week, I had occasion. This is going to be one of those times where I have to be very careful about identifying this human being. I want to make sure not to, not to identify and editors get ready. I may slip and I'll be tell you. <laughs> We're watching. Um, I saw an individual who has risen to a position of considerable authority in this world we're talking about of educational institutions. And it's a person who I knew way back when they were about 21. And I know what kind of person they were. I learned a lot from this person. And, you know, now and then you stalk a person online to see what's up with them. And I saw that this person has risen to a certain position. And I saw a video clip of this person having been recorded saying the sorts of things that a person in this position is supposed to say. And this person is a complete innocent. And it was interesting because I thought, you know, it's funny. I never thought of this person as speaking this language, but this person has clearly mastered it thoroughly. And they were on there all well lit and talking about the community that they now run. And this community is a body of students. I think I have to leave it there. But everything this person was saying in this little five minutes was basically translated. Shining happy face. The music in the background was that Copeland-esque music that they use for this sort of thing. All this is supposed to be the most goodly thing in the world. But what this person was saying was, In this community, we will not subject black and Latino people to the expectations that we hold other students to. That was what this person beautifully said. So never using the words, it's like medieval liturgy trying to figure out what they're really talking about. But that's what this person was saying. And this is some video that I imagine they put on their site to encourage, you know, diverse people to solicit membership in this community. That person is typical. That person is not extraordinary. That person has been brought into the guild. Does that mean that there's this winning? And, you know, I think you and I hear from so many people who are of a different mind because of the nature of social media that maybe I'm getting spoiled. Why do you think that it's victory that the people who feel that way, that people feel that way when it's really maybe a thousand people in certain high places? How do they determine a society, when you and I both can tell that the further you get away from people like that, the more people tend to, frankly, have sense. It's just that they don't tend to say anything out loud. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, man, I, my model isn't uh, well enough developed to figure this one out. Uh, yeah, I mean, what what I want to say is uh, uh, I've been saying for a long time that this was a bubble, and it would burst. And the analogy mm-hmm. simply was everybody thinks the stock will be higher tomorrow than it is today. 
So they buy today and that pushes up the price. And as long as those expectations are self-reinforcing, it looks like it was a good bet, except if the underlying value of the stock is not that much and the thing gets 10, 15, 20, 100 times overvalued, eventually somebody figures out that this can't go on. They undercut, the price starts falling, and as it falls, it falls faster because it needed that increment of energy to keep it going up and pretty soon it gets down to where it's really being valued at its true worth which is a lot less than you bought it halfway on the way up that's what i thought this was uh and i kept waiting for the bubble to burst uh and it has not yet done um and there's a lot of things that could be said about this and trump would be one of them if we were to go off into a sidebar on what are the different elements in american political culture that keep this basket case afloat the basket case being the intellectual and political leadership classes of African American have led their people into a hopeless cul-de-sac. Okay, that's my view. Obviously, people will disagree. But what keeps it afloat? Why hasn't the bubble bursted? And I just think, and I mentioned this one thing, it's not the only thing by any means. The cops is another thing, although that's a self-creating dynamic in and of itself. Uh, but uh, I just mean, uh, come on, you know, the advent of Trump makes it impossible for their, I mean, not impossible, we black people have our kind of me too problem. In other words, if Trump says uh, the, the me too problem being Biden and the, uh, and the uh, Tara Reid uh, accusation and how do the women handle that? And we have our, mm -hmm. you know, because after all, it's true what Trump said about the inner cities. They have been badly governed. I mean, it's, it go on and on and on, okay? It's true that blacks have, may have a different interest about the border than other groups based on their structural position within the society. We could have a debate about it. It's debatable. It's just, it's, you know, and I could go on in this vein. Affirmative action has deep and profound problems, man, et cetera. Uh, so uh, all these things are true, but these things that I should think would undermine the upward drift of ta Coates's stock somehow are not kicking in. And my model of the dynamics here is not sophisticated enough to figure out exactly why, except we've been at this for a long time. I know I've been saying the stuff that I've been saying since the 1980s, man. Well, Glenn, here's a question, because you were saying stuff then, and this is a genuine question. How in the world did Shelby Steele's The Content of Our Character win the National Book Award? Because that must have looked like something was changing. How did that I think happen? it was the National Book Critics Circle Award, but uh, it was- Okay, so it's that I'm on. Yeah, well, but it's, it's, it's still, it's still I, I think, I think, but never mind. It was a high honor. He also got an Emmy. He also won an Emmy for a uh, narration of a documentary that he did about Bensonhurst or something like that back, right. back in the day. How did that happen? I mean, I, well, like, you wouldn't expect it. I mean, where was his uh, essays published? Uh, where was it? It was in uh, one of these Tony magazines. Um, was it in Harper's? It's funny. Yeah, it was I'm in Harper's. It was in Harper's. I'm in the room <laughs> where I have my race books, and I'm thinking I'm, if it's It was there, in I'm Harper's. Uh, that's where uh, I'm Black, You're White, Who's Innocent was published. I believe that was the name of his, of his classic essay. Here it is. So This is the content of our character, 1990, yeah, if I'm not either. mistaken. Yeah. And it got um, blah, 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 provocative bestseller, National Book Critics Circle Award. I'm now on the board of that. I know people who've been on it forever. I'm going to ask how this happened because I'd like to know. That's interesting. You think and somebody is going to be there who can tell you? Nobody there was around 30 years ago. There's one. And okay. he would actually, he would know all about he it. He would know. Okay, good. Harper's good. Commentary, New York Times Magazine, and the American Scholar. That's where those pieces had. So been. I think on the on the race uh, front, maybe you had a more robust and open uh, environment. I mean, some of the magazines we could talk about the people. What about Martin Peretz? Yeah, I mean, I know you know yeah. who I'm talking about, and Leon Lucas too. Uh, what, what about uh, what about uh, the guy at Commentary? Uh, uh, Norman Podhoritz. Norman Podhoritz, and you know, my Negro problem and ours. And yeah. Commentary published that uh, James Baldwin. Uh, piece that you referred to in your essay uh, from protest to politics, if I'm not mistaken. What about you know, people like Nathan Glazer and Irving Crystal, who are not, you know, and they're very different people unto themselves, but they were not Darth Vader incarnate. They were not racist. They, you know, uh, especially no. Crystal. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't mean to say this because I'm not saying Irving Crystal was a racist, but I mean, I'm saying Nathan Glazer was a very sweet guy. 
He was. Uh, he's married yeah. to an Indian woman uh, for a half century or whatever. You know. Yeah. I mean, just construe these people as uh, because he wrote a book called Affirmative Discrimination, which was skeptical about affirmative action. To construe these people as anti-black, to construe no, Daniel Patrick that's... Moynihan as anti-black. But now I step out onto a limb and I get near the hagiography. I mean, the uh, ideological structures right. that these people have built to justify themselves because Moynihan's supposed to be, a, a, you know, a guy with a black hat on. Right. Bigot, et cetera. But no, I don't um, I don't think. Those awards and the sorts of things that people in high places in the university and the media say and do are different for me than the truth. And I guess we might differ in that I get the feeling most people understand what the truth is. The issue is whether or not you're allowed to say it. And if, as long as I can tell that on a certain level, everybody knows. But then again, I'm talking myself into a hole. Because if people can not tell the truth and end up having the keys to anywhere they want to go, getting a certain kind of treatment, see, I don't care because I like my life. I'm genuinely not jealous. And so I'm not saying you are, but I'm just trying to think, <laughs> you know, are, I'm those good. People, I'm good, man. You know I'm good. are those people, are they winning? And I don't want what they have. I don't well, know. I'm not I'm not saying it in terms of personal, although I guess I did start that way, in terms of my personal place in the scheme of things. I'm saying it in terms of the wheel of history turning and, and where are we headed? And I think we're headed down. I mean, I think I think it's a disaster, frankly. I despair uh, for the future because the lock in here is very, very profound. Um, I mean, like I said, there are these principles. I think these principles are really almost transcended at some level. Uh, this this issue of getting beyond race, this this idea of the politics does it's very poisonous. Do you know that Biden put out his uh, what he's going to do for black people, and he has a line in there that says uh, we don't think race neutral solutions work. And I wonder what was that line doing there? Why why did because, he say that? Right, I know so that's boilerplate, but. Yeah, some person said put it in, and he figured, why not? I was about to say, how would we feel if Biden becomes president and his vice president is either Stacey Abrams or Elizabeth Warren? What is their black agenda going to be? And is their black agenda going to be, in our view, hobbled by wokeness? Now, Elizabeth Warren says the right things about reparations, but would she, if she actually had presidential or even vice presidential power try to put that into effect? I genuinely don't know. But let's say that well, she let me. I'm sorry, go ahead. And let's suppose, you know, they're in and, you know, especially with Stacey Abrams and they want to do something for black America. What would they do based on our advice that they wouldn't do because they're too busy reading Ibram Kendi? This is a genuine question. You know, uh, I get the feeling that they might say some things that Ibram Kendi wants to hear. I'm t taking him as a symbol. They, well, will have, they will have him down to the White House to say some stuff. But what are they going to try to get through Congress? And would we be so upset about it? You know? They're going to get the Democratic wonder. agenda through Congress. I mean, what? They're going to get uh, minority business support. They're going to get uh, 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 what Maxine Waters wants. I mean, you know... <laughs> What does she want? But, uh, well, I don't. This this has been going on for a long time. I don't expect anything new. They're going to get what James Clapper wants, right? And those people don't. They are not people. Uh, who minimum are wage, health care for people. They're going to get what uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez wants. Okay, yeah. The first two people are going to get environmental justice with a black face on it. Right. The first two people, they are part of a certain generation. They are not people who think about how to really change the paradigm. I mean, I'm not trying to disrespect them, but they're in there doing their job, going step by step, but nothing dramatic is going to happen. And maybe a lot of politics isn't dramatic. Now, AOC is different, and she, of course, is a leftist and wants to turn everything upside down. But to tell you the truth, and you know that I've got my little crush on her, et cetera, how is that going? I mean, all power to her, but... It doesn't look to me like those things are going to happen under her watch. I mean, I'm glad she's there, but I don't know. I don't see this leftism triumphing except in terms of 
people who write books and write for certain media organs. Well, well let and, me notice that you have elided and, you know, you've moved gracefully from talking about black people to talking about uh, Democratic Party politics and the progressive mm-hmm. agenda. They're not the same thing at all. Um, the, the progressive agenda is going to decarcerate. It's going to say there are too many people in prison. It's going to say structural racism. The, the progressive agenda is going to raise the minimum wage to $20 an hour if that will help. They're going to be liberal with respect to who comes across the border. They're going to be pro-life and very much influenced by that. They're going to be worried about the planet. And if you don't think the economic implications of dealing vigorously with a concern about the planet will hit hard at people who are on the margins of the economy, you've got another thing coming. The idea that you're going to employ all of these uh, inner city people as building retrofitters when they can't read is absurd. Yes, I said it. Okay. Now, what do they need? You're asking me, they need school choice. I'm not asking you to agree with my uh, policy positions. They need a complete revolutionary engagement with the delivery of educational services to disadvantaged people. They need public safety. The cops are their friends, not their enemies. Black Lives Matter ideology is completely wrongheaded. Mothers of the movement have no place at a Democratic Party convention that actually wants to represent the interests of black people. They need hard-headed engagement with the actual problems, including the failures that confront their people across the socioeconomic landscape. They need tutors. They they need big brothers and big sisters. They need adoption uh, taken up as a movement. Uh, They need the church. John? Okay, if we actually want to change the situation, the ideological foundations of modern liberalism, of which the blacks in the Democratic Party are an electorally vital but intellectually insignificant component, needs to be completely scuttled. It'll go on, it's going to look like it's a conservative program because it's going to be a conservative program in substantial part. Not entirely, and I don't say that to endorse any particular political party. The teachers' unions are an anathema to achieving the goals necessary here. Full stop. You know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. One place I disagree with you is that I think that the people that we're talking about, and it's the men, it's not the women. The women do work. It's the men. They also they, raise the kids. They also raise the kids. Excuse me. Yeah, they, a lot of it is because they raise the kids. But there's a, a, a dispossessed black men problem. They need to go to work. And if a lot of them are functionally illiterate, well, you know, by the time you're 17 or 18, frankly, the chances that that's going to change significantly are small. And human beings function completely orally until about, frankly, most people about 300 years ago, they're stuck. They're never going to be people of print. But they need they need to work. And, you know, this is my subway cliche. You see this kind of person where their tacit sense is that what their job in life is, is to walk around being charismatically oppositional. And to the extent that they're not fully employed, there's a part of them that thinks that that's okay because the cops don't like them. That's got to go. That person needs vocational education to become, you know, something like an electrician, somebody who installs air conditioners or something like that, be a plumber, or if not that, retrofitting. They need something where they, one, acquire a skill, two, get a sense deep in their bones of showing up somewhere every day and that actually having some kind of benefit, and frankly, doing it with a lot of people like them. Because a lot of why somebody like that might not want to work is because they're not used to stepping beyond their boundaries. They don't like white people. You can kind of understand why. They don't want to deal with anybody else. Often they don't even like Latinos. They like their friends. And so a lot of why they like the corners, as it used to be called, is because you can make a certain amount of money and deal with your friends. If these guys are going to go off into these working class jobs, helping to rebuild the country where almost everybody they work with is somebody who listens to their music and talks like them, dresses like them, has a history like them, probably doesn't have a father they grew up with like them, whole thing. Then, you know, it's hard enough for them to settle into the idea that they actually have to work every day. Folks, if you think that I'm stereotyping these people, there's a literature about black males left behind. This is not a stereotype. It's reality. They are not used to going to work every day because they never knew a guy who did. That's hard enough. They shouldn't. I don't want them to also have to learn how to deal with people unlike them. They've got chips on their shoulder. The streets are all about respect. 
So these people, the minute anything goes a little bit wrong with somebody who isn't like them, they leave. They don't kill anybody. They leave. They, they, they quit because they're so obsessed with this idea of you better not disrespect me. You can't change it. Make it a job where everybody's just like them and everybody gets their fucking respect. I think that really anything that threatens to <laughs> threatens, I'm really imagining how it would feel to a lot of these guys because I've never known anything like this. So, yes, I said threaten. But anything that puts people like that into work and changes their lives to me, is of almost religious significance, which is why, actually, for those of you who can see, I actually did a pray gesture. Don't you want those guys to be put on a line and made to see what it feels like to, to work because they didn't grow up watching anybody do it? Because they would learn to like it instead of standing on the train being mean, which is what a lot of them do as, as a job. Well, my friend Bob Cherry, the economist at Brooklyn College, he's emeritus now. He's come on the program a few times. It's a white guy, a Jewish guy. Uh, he's you know, this a lefty, uh, old lefty economist guy who's kind of moved toward the center, maybe even the center right. Uh, and you see his stuff a lot, uh, data driven and whatnot, has spent a lot of time talking about the plight of black men and about education for him, you know, vocational education. Black men, yeah. again, yes, we do speak in, in stereotypes. And, you know, obviously this is uh, someone wants to be careful how you frame it and how you say it. Obviously, we know that, uh, quote unquote, black men are not one thing we ourselves being black men and not perhaps fitting into the stereotype that we're constructing here so mindful of all of that uh, what do you do with somebody who uh, drops out of high school finishes high school and doesn't really have the competency of uh, numeracy and literacy to be able to function in the modern society i mean they got to get a skill they need work uh you know and everybody doesn't go into the army anymore like they used to and the army won't take them anyway that's yeah. you know especially if they have um, a record yeah. Uh, so, you know, what should a community college be doing? How do you, you know, engage, you know, and uh, Bob is worried uh, and I'm not hiding behind Bob Cherry. I'm just giving him as one example of a constructive way of trying to engage with the question, what to do with those guys um, about, uh, you know, you don't want to send them over to uh, the city university and have them taking remedial courses and hanging around for two or three years. You want them to learn a skill. Maybe there's some kind of uh, co-op thing with the private sector where people can come in and, uh, do, uh, you know, 12 months or 18 months or something and get some kind of certification and be, you know, able to take over jobs if there's a shortage of labor, which there does tend to be a shortage of labor, doesn't there, since we're importing labor for so many things. Mm-hmm. Um, shortage of uh, of, uh, of people who are able to actually do those function in those positions. Um, I mean, I you know, my friend Harold Pollack, I shouldn't just mention Robert Cherry, my friend Harold Pollack, uh, the uh, social scientist out at the University of Chicago School of Public Service Administration, who's also been a guest here on the Glenn Show and works a lot with disadvantaged and ex-offender populations and whatnot. There's all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's, uh, what do you, you know, uh, uh, second chance kind of coming back into society after incarceration and stuff like that. Um, you know what? So, su- what surprised me, though, was, and I don't have an answer to this, um, there are places you don't want to go is that we're having this conversation about these men in lower level jobs. And if you go one level below, say, training to be a plumber or something like that, you're talking about the things that we bring in people from other countries to do. And I, this is now 15, 10 years ago, I used to talk about some, some of these things with white public intellectual sorts. I'm thinking of a couple in particular, and I'm going to leave them unnamed for now. One of them just passed away, and the other one wouldn't want to hear this, but they both wrote a lot about race. But they were both a little glib. You knew one of them very well, but we won't say who they were. Both a little glib. And I was talking about, can't we have dispossessed black men, for example, picking fruit? It was For some reason, we were talking about North Carolina. And oh, this I, know, person, I know what you're talking about. Go ahead. You, you Yeah. And this person said, just said, those guys aren't going to pick fruit. And frankly, it was a kind of a wine-laced conversation. And, you know, we weren't really going into much detail. But the person kept saying, those people aren't going to pick fruit. And as sloppy as that is, she's right. I got the feeling, yeah, they're, they're not. A lot of these guys would rather be on the dole or have no money or go to the corner than pick apples. I don't know how I know that's true, but it feels right. Doesn't it? And I'm not sure what you could do about that. They're not going to mow the lawn. Not enough to make a living. Is that wrong of me to have felt guilty back then and listening to that? I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, I get it. And I have been told that many times that uh, the uh, migrant workers coming across the southern border who are picking fruit and working in the fields in American agriculture are doing jobs that Americans wouldn't do, even if those migrants weren't there to do them. Mm-hmm. And that's a counterfactual. Of course, the question is, at what wage would they or would they not do the job? Uh, the wage would be different if you had to rely on domestic labor. They probably would be unionized or more effective at representing worker rights, and they'd have better benefits or whatever, and the farm prices would go up commensurately, and we'd be paying more for our fruits and vegetables. It would be a different equilibrium. I don't want to say intrinsically they won't take the jobs. I'll say they don't take them at those wages, given the alternatives. And the alternatives are the informal economy and the uh, welfare state. Uh, right. And, you know, uh, our people, I assume, are making the choices that they're making based on their own self-interest, and I don't begrudge them you know, uh, making those choices. We structure the system through our policies. And if we do it in a way that uh, doesn't foster their ultimate interests when they make the choices that they're making, given their constraints, then it's on us, not on them, I might say. I don't want to make it a character issue. This is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I think a tight labor market, and uh, here's the way one entrepreneur friend of mine put it, who's uh, very big on empowering domestic uh, uh, Americans in the tech industry and sees, you know, the visas going out to bring in people from South Asia and whatnot. And he says something like, unless uh, Apple or Google or, uh, you know, whatever can tell me, or HP uh, can tell me um, who is the smartest kid in the South Bronx? Who's the smartest inner city kid in East Palo Alto. I'm not asking you about their test scores. I'm asking you about their smarts. Unless they can tell me who he or she is, I'm not giving them another visa. By which he means simply, there's diamonds in the rough out there that we're not even bothered to look for. There's the potential to develop human talent that nobody has an incentive to invest in. If we don't presuppose that these people are simply incapable of functioning in the modern world, They're being failed by a variety of systems, and perhaps they're making some bad choices. But if we were forced to, we'd find ways of ferreting out what was possible there and channeling it and bringing it along. Now, that might be a pipe dream. That might be pie in the sky. But but I do think that the the globalization phenomenon is not just goods moving. It's also people moving. And I I think that it takes a pressure gap, uh, cap, uh, opens a pressure cap a little bit on the system that allows them to not have to face up to some stuff that they might otherwise have to face up to. So, I mean, I'm, I'm agreeing with somebody like Steve Bannon when I say something like that. And I know that that's, you know, it is what it is. But again, I want to say this African-American interests require significant intellectual work to figure out exactly how to think about it. Okay. This knee jerk reflexive thing. Mm. There's no argument that I've heard from people about the border. I'm now talking about immigration policy. What Mm -hmm. the future of the country is going to be. How many people come into the country? Who becomes a citizen? What is the black position there? It's not Mm -hmm. obvious. It is not Mm -hmm. at all obvious what the black position should be there. The enlightened, sophisticated black position. Or maybe there shouldn't be one position. Maybe there should be a real argument. There's no real argument now because we're all woke. Yeah, I think the hardest thing about what we're talking about is that It used to be, the aging man says it used to be, I'm talking about before I even need myself, but not too long before it, that everyone knew in civil rights that this stuff was hard. So Rustin knew that this stuff required, you know, chin scratching thinking. And in a way, I don't mean to dump on the man, but Malcolm X had a lot to do with the new notion that all of it can be cut through by just talking about white people's feelings and racism and that there's some kind of overarching authenticity about that way of looking at it. And yeah, the hard thing is that this is tough policy issues. I've never had anything glib to say about immigration as relating to the race situation because I haven't studied it hard enough. And I know that the answer is not going to be something where you can just snap your fingers, but we are encouraged today to think that there's this one string you can pull that just explains everything, white supremacy. And that is, um, I can put you in me, and I feel like I'm, I, I would say stupid or it's a failure. I would be inclined to say that it's just, it's lazy. It's simplistic. It makes you feel good for a second, but it doesn't really solve any problems to trace it all to white, something called white supremacy. And that is what you're worried is winning. 
I feel like it's more about rhetoric than action, but I need to be able to back up why I'm not as scared of it as you are. And maybe I can do that more clearly next time we talk, because now you have me really thinking about it. Why don't I think of that stuff as winning? Have I sequestered it too much in my brain? I think, okay, that's just the parishioners bowing and scraping. I'm out here in real life. But then again, at what point do I have to realize that Hitler got here? <laughs> and I'm not sure if I have the answer to that at this point. Uh, the, those were very interesting musings. And yeah, we do have to circle back. And yeah, we're getting a little bit long here. I want to close this out if I can with uh, just a thought, <laughs> which is you mentioned Malcolm X and it made it. it I mean, I kind of get what you're saying, you know, about the, the male, the balled up fist, you know, the angry uh, gesture, the performance and, and the, you know, the kind of black power thing. Malcolm and black power were different, of course. Malcolm was a Muslim. Malcolm was a, a devotee of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam. It's Stokely and, Carmichael that really kind of starts. But what I want to say about Malcolm, the reason I mentioned him is because there was another side to that. And that was the side that said, don't depend upon the white man to take care of your business, to raise your children, <laughs> to make you have wealth, to fix you. OK, because he ain't coming and he doesn't give a damn. It's on you. OK, and that's what gets conceded, it seems to me, when you lapse into this posture that these people that we've been criticizing want to take us into. You say they're obsessed with showing that it's not our fault, but it can't be because if it's not our fault, it's also not something for which we're responsible. And as I said, existentially, in some, some deep philosophic and spiritual foundation, we have to be responsible for our own lives. Uh, so teaching our children that there's nothing they can do, that's what's wrong with Between the World and Me. That, that, that's what's uh, so um, catastrophic about the cultural barons of this society uh, uh, honoring that work in the way that they have done. We can't be teaching our children that their future is outside of their hands, uh, that, that the, the depredations of, of white supremacy are such that we have no room for maneuver. I mean, um, so that's what this guy Robert Woodson animated at the 1776 project uh, with which you and I both have some affiliation. Uh, he most of all wants to teach the young black people of this country that their fate is in their own hands. As it is. Is the goal mostly to reach younger people? I'm learning that. Now. Well, it should be. I don't want to speak for him. And it's, you know, there's a it's a complicated uh, public relations problem about how you run an operation like this. And you and I are just I just wonder. Yeah. Uh, professors, uh, the young people is certainly a big part of it. Certainly that's uh, part of where uh, the 1619 have aimed their fire at uh, influencing. I get the it. People. You know, that's it's about the narrative, man. It's about what the country it's about. What kind of country is this? What, what's worth loving here? What's worth affirming here? What, 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 what is the story of this country? Who's going to tell it? And what are they going to say about the founding, about Lincoln and the refounding, about the Civil War, about defeating fascism in the 20th century, about the settlement of the West, the building of the railroads, and yes, the conquest of the Native people, et cetera, et cetera, about what is liberal democracy in the 20th century. It's a beacon to the entire world. What was the Cold War for crying out loud? You're going to tell the history of this country through that uh, distorted uh, identitarian lens? Okay, it's about what kind of country is it? It's about who are black people? That's what this is about. Who are we? Are we, in <laughs> fact, the products of a white supremacist history that leaves us no room for maneuver? Or are we responsible for such successes and failures as can uh, you know, be uh, laid at our feet? We are hmm. responsible for what we do. The murder rate, you know, this whole, this whole intellectual framework, they can be gunning down their own people on the streets and you dare not whisper about it. Okay? You want to change the subject. You know, and then black on black crime becomes something that you can dismiss as easily as a colorblind society. As if the struggle to get beyond the stigma of race, which animated African American history for centuries, could just be overturned because you changed your name from Negro to Black to African American. You know, if this is also a future topic, if the idea is to reach the young people who are going to be reached by you know these civic lessons about sixteen, nineteen, you have to fight 
fire with fire, and it is not with the kinds of things you and I write. I mean, I think if you're going to reach a person who is a modern person, the only way to really do that, and I'm, I'm thinking out loud, short of making a series of video shorts, which I don't think anybody connected with us could afford, it would have to be a podcast. You have to do that through the ear, and you would have to use oral language and not written language. I don't think that it can be about articles written in the Atlantic. It cannot be about 200-page books. Those, those ways of communicating get more obsolete by the year. And we date ourselves in that that's what we do. I'm just thinking that in order to get across to this generation, we have to start thinking about the spoken word. And I don't mean spoken word poetry, but that's only going to work with real people saying it with their mouth because there's so much of the other people saying things with their mouths. It's just a thought. There's going to have to be a YouTube onslaught as far as that goes. Well, let this be the first volley. Yeah, we can try. John McWhorter, Columbia University. Thanks for coming on The Glenn Show, John. Thank you, Glenn.